Welcome to a Political Warfare Primer. I'm Dr. Erwin Warkenton, and what I'm going to be presenting to you in the next three talks is an introduction to what political warfare actually is. This first part is called A Genius for Persuasion. I wish to warn you ahead of time that I may be using terminology that might need further explanation than is offered in this first presentation. These will be expanded upon in various in-depth treatments of topics for which they are integral. I'm going to give you as much context as you need initially. An example of this is the term political warfare itself. These two words appear here together and one might be a little unsure as to how they relate to one another. Not that one might not have a good idea of how one might interpret them. However, within the context of the British government and what is now the Ministry of Defense and its military, it has a particular meaning somewhat akin to psychological warfare, though it has its own twist that makes it unusual in some senses and goes well beyond the traditional sense of psych war. So let's get on to a genius for persuasion. Ever since war on an organized basis began, there has been some form of political warfare in play. Leaders of nations at war busied themselves with the seduction of enemy tribes and even with the sowing of dissension in enemy countries before the beginning of open hostilities. Hannibal of Carthage was an excellent exponent of the first method. He needed to convince the Gallic leadership to let him pass even before he could attempt the Alps with his elephants, and Philip of Macedon of the second. In the Middle Ages, scrolls wrapped around arrows were shot over battlements to convince those inside of the futility of their resistance. It certainly was cheaper than sending men over the top, undermining walls, or just waiting them out. Elizabeth I's spymaster, Walsingham, in England, and Louis XIII's Richelieu in France were masters of quiet political warfare. Napoleon knew the value of a good newspaper story. During the Franco-Prussian War, the French made extensive use of pamphlets describing German atrocities at home and abroad. It did not matter that they never happened, since they were at the start of rumors that had an inertia all of their own. According to Hazel C. Benjamin in 1932 in the Journal of Modern History, she says a typical topic dealt with the depravity of the enemy, a favored theme in every war. But in this respect, the Journal Officiel, at least, was very mild, as became an official mouthpiece. The only outright atrocity stories reported in it were reminiscences of the Napoleonic Wars. Early in the war, the refusal of Biden to adhere to the Declaration of St. Petersburg provided an opportunity for dilating on the lack of humanitarianism among the Germans and, conversely, the superiority of the French in this respect. In fact, according to Kirsten L. Cooper in her 2020 dissertation entitled Honest Germans and Perfidious French, National Ideas and Pamphlet Propaganda During the War of Louis XIV. He says, during the wars of Louis XIV, French and German political pamphleteers regularly mobilized national rhetoric to persuade audiences, mobilize military support, and justify the political decisions taken by their monarchs. These were then all recycled in the Great War and started myths that were accepted by some as truth, even today. For example, the crucified Canadian soldier. This poster and the resulting discussions have created controversies as recent as 2000, when the representative statue named Canada's Golgotha by the British sculptor Francis Derwent Wood, produced in 1918, was displayed at an exhibition entitled Under the Sign of the Cross, creative expressions of Christianity in Canada, 
at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. They didn't address the issue, of course, that this probably never happened. This has been closely investigated by a number of different committees, and even the fact that they have a name for the soldier indicates that this particular soldier did not join the Canadian military until months after this is supposed to have happened. So you can see how powerful some of these ideas can be and how they can perpetuate myths about the other side. And this is precisely what you're aiming at in political warfare. Now, Bismarck also recognized the value of the right kind of message, or at least the right length of message. He personally deleted from German communiques any item that might in foreign papers be used against Germany. Bismarck ordered the press bureau to, quote, let it be short or no one will read it, unquote. He seems to have anticipated Twitter by more than a hundred years. It's also noteworthy that it is reported by numerous sources, among them Michael Kunzik in 1997, that Bismarck had himself written some 500 plus lead newspaper articles during his time as a journalist. However, it is the British at the end of World War I and during World War II who perfected political warfare, and it was through their training of the right candidates that this excellence was maintained, some would argue, until today. Behold the enduring myth of the great British spy maintained by the venerable 007 James Bond, who did indeed spring from the activities and operation of the Special Operations Executive, the Secret Intelligence Service, the Political Warfare Executive, and Ian Fleming's mind. Notably, in the PWE archival materials, one can find at least one operational plan for subversive actions written and proposed by Fleming himself. In truth, the greatest known coup of the British Secret Service is most likely the enduring image of the superiority of the British intelligence services, which has fed a consistent stream of entertainment, docudrama, and pseudo-news pieces even today. One must keep in mind that the only reason we know about these things is because they want us to know about them. The really important or potentially spectacular stuff we have not yet heard about because they really know how to keep a secret. Now I should take a moment to explain why I'm going to spend a lot of time throughout this series talking and banging on about the political warfare executive. After all, its activities, wrapped up almost 80 years ago, was using technology that was cutting edge then, but is now 80 years obsolete. This, however, is where we sometimes go wrong. The psychology involved in delivering a propaganda message has changed very little over the decades, centuries, and even millennia. You'll notice that I also spend a lot of time referring back to people such as Philip of Macedon and Hannibal of Carthage. While they did not have the technology we have today, they employed precisely the same principles in getting their message across and winning their particular political wars. The technologies we employ today, such as the World Wide Web, social media, the internet, television, video, and politically enhanced digital images, is not an improvement of substance, but of efficiency in its deliverability. The PWE was also the only organization to leave behind a detailed roadmap for how they made their decisions and precisely what viruses they delivered in their propaganda. They even showed concern for the propaganda time bombs they left behind in the political, philosophical, ideological war zone, i.e. the minds of those exposed to their messages. They also often explained precisely why they did what they did, kind enough to keep track of the rumors they were trying to spread 
and were honest in indicating the truth value of each. After all, they needed to keep straight in their own mind what was the truth and what was a lie. It is a unique insight into how the propaganda of the past was created and provides us with a primer on how propaganda and political warfare is conducted today and can be in the future. After all, we still use the same basic tools, words, in their various forms and means of transmission, of course, and images in their various formats, moving or not. Moreover, we also seek to combine them, just as they did. In short, we have much to still learn from the political warfare executive. This is especially true because we have only had the, their documents available to us for a very short time, and they seemed eager to teach us. As an additional side note, the intelligence services of the First and Second World War were the first to realize that they needed to inform themselves of the other cultures of the world in order to deliver their messages and in this way, it mirrors the situation today. They realized that they were not armies fighting with one another in isolation, but entire nations, societies, and ways of thinking that were going to war with one another. The only difference is that it can now be just as effectively delivered by a teenage malcontent in the basement of his parents' home, provided he has access to the internet. Throughout the Second World War, the British military, in conjunction with the Foreign Office, the War Office, the Ministry of Economic Warfare, and the Ministry of Information, sought to undermine German morale through the development and implementation of propaganda campaigns. These operations were planned and executed by the political warfare executive, and sometimes you'll hear me refer to them simply as the PWE. This most secret organization remained mostly unknown, and the files closed until relatively recently. Though some have already been opened in the 1980s, and some memoirs were approved by the British cabinet, it has remained a shadowy organization until the publication of David Garnett's history, which appeared in 2002, 57 years after the end of the Second World War. While it seems to be a recent tome, in reality, government cabinet permissions show that the history of the PWE was written sometime after August 1946 and thought lost before the manuscript was found buried in a cabinet file in 1952. There had been a deadline set of August 1948 for its completion and there's no indication that Garnett was late in delivering the manuscript. It was then archived and closed to the public. It is this manuscript, which is well worth a read, that was published in 2002 under the title The Secret History of PWE. Starting in the 1990s, the British archives began opening more and more of the files that dealt with the PWE's activities though approximately 5% of the files remained closed, with some to remain closed until 2063. This is at least the latest date that I've been able to confirm with any assurance. In order to undertake its work, the PWE needed trained personnel that could develop propaganda tools that would reach over the English Channel and speak directly to the German and Italian people as well as the mass of occupied nations. This is no different than the various agencies, officially and unofficially, sponsored by the various national governments around the world today that are trying to further their overt and covert agendas. Training such as this was not a peacetime activity, and the British suffered from a dearth of individuals who were willing and capable of engaging in what was called by some in Britain the most ungentlemanly form of warfare, especially when it came to what was known as black propaganda. It was thus out of necessity that the PWE developed a syllabus 
and a college at Wing House, close to Piccadilly, and then Brondesbury for the white and grey propaganda. Black propaganda was dealt with at Bush House, where it operated under the cover name Political Intelligence Department. The ultimate aim of political warfare, as the PWE understood it, was to win the peace, that is, to win the war of ideas, which does not end when hostilities end. This is why political warfare is perhaps more apt in describing what is happening today. For example, political warfare might be defined as the systematic process of influencing the will and so directing the actions of the enemy and those in enemy-occupied countries according to the needs of one's higher strategy. In addition, political warfare will be shown to be an indispensable fourth fighting arm. The only real fighting arm during a period of virtual warfare, whose principal instrument is propaganda, with its primary objective being assisting in the destruction of the foundation of the enemy's war machine with or without traditional military action. Therefore, it will detail the requirements of effective political warfare, which involves the cooperation of the three other fighting services and of aggressive diplomacy. Finally, political warfare's support role as a repository of soft knowledge and skills, which can assist in the preparation for specific combat operations, but perhaps more importantly, for the peace, in quotation marks, that follows. So there you have it, a very quick preamble to the introduction. And now we're going to move on to the modern context for all of this.